today, but in particular, I, I believe that what I have to say is something that is applicable to both men and to women here today, but I'm going to address my marks in particular towards our fathers here today because I believe it is a, it's a golden opportunity. I was actually encouraged for the first time, and I've been looking at statistics for a long, long time when it comes to, um, to marriage and children being born, families, you know, fathers and fatherless homes, all of those things. And I'm really thankful that over the last five years, and, and the first time I think in my lifetime, there's actually been a little bit of an upward tick in children that are being born into two-parent homes. And uh, that is a, that's a, a, a great change, a remarkable change. But it is pretty astonishing how direct the corollary is between uh, children being born into two-parent homes and the success rate, if you break it down by demographic or ethnicity, there is a direct correlation that comes with that. And the people that uh, are most successful in our society in North America tend to be Asians. And uh, Asians, uh, by numbers, they end up being the most prosperous and uh, having you know, a lot of measurable successes. But what's interesting is that over 90% of Asian children are born into two-parent families. And, uh, and so it's, it's, it's an amazing thing. And so it, it's worth thinking about these things um, when it comes to, obviously, our role in the church and our, obviously beyond any kind of study or societal thing. We're wanting to honor God's principles, God's precepts, and the, the family unit that he has designed because God knows what works best for human flourishing. It's God that wants us to succeed. And so I'm going to be really focusing today on the relationship between Elijah and Elisha as a part of my message. And so we're going to read from the book of 2 Kings uh, chapter 2, and I'm going to begin reading at verse 7. So this uh, passage that we're picking up is about the time when Elijah's earthly ministry is about to be finished. And if you're not familiar with Elijah, he was a, uh, a prophet, the most notable maybe of the Old Testament prophets. And, and so uh, he was training up a successor who, not confusingly at all, is named Elisha. And so um, Elijah and Elisha, I mean, you, there, no one's ever gotten confused over those two things ever before. But anyway, in verse 7 it says, And fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood facing them at a distance, while the two of them stood by the Jordan. Now Elijah took his mantle, rolled it up, and struck the water, and it was divided this way and that, so that the two of them crossed over on dry ground. And so it was when they had crossed over that Elijah said to Elisha, Ask, what may I do for you before I am taken away from you? Elisha uh, said, excuse me, uh, Elisha said, Please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. So he said, You have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me, when I am taken from you, it shall be for you. But if not, it shall not be so. Then it happened as they continued on and talked, that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it and he cried out, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. So he saw him no more, and he took hold of his own clothes and tore them into two pieces. He also took up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had struck the water, it was divided this way and that. And Elisha crossed over. And I'm going to be talking to you today on the subject, Where is the God of Elijah? Last year on Father's Day, I referred in at length to a passage that Paul wrote. And I want to just briefly refer back to that. Uh, because Paul says something very wise to the Corinthian church. He said in 1 Corinthians 4 and 14, uh, I do not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I warn you. For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you, imitate me. 
I did a little research on the number of, of schools and teachers, and I found that in the United States alone, there is well over 6 million teachers across public schools, universities, and trade schools. And the average person will probably have somewhere between 50 to 100 different teachers and instructors, including uh, supply teachers in their academic life. But if they're lucky, they will have one father in their life. There are millions upon millions of online classes and courses and YouTube has become the place where people learn how to fix cars and survive in the woods and uh, uh, how to fix appliances and learn life hacks and how to solve math problems and millions of other things, some of which you probably really shouldn't know how to do. But if you want to know how to do it, you can learn on YouTube. Uh, we've got apps and self-help books and self-help books and classes and Zoom and virtual instructors and online. On and on it goes. I've noted in conversations with Sam, we were just having this conversation a week ago, that says the more time that he has spent in university, the more he realizes that there are plenty of uni university professors, even at this highest level of teaching in one of Canada's premier universities, that really aren't very good at what they're doing. And in some classes, he has had to resort to turning to YouTube to learning a skill or a concept because... The instructor that he's paying big bucks to teach him is not doing a very good job of explaining the concept. There are a lot of instructors, Paul says, in our lives. We have more instructors than ever before, but unfortunately we have fewer and fewer fathers. And from the 1960s until today, the number of households without a father has multiplied four times. And if you look at the statistics of a father that is married to the mother, the percentage is even higher. And I'm not going to spend the time today to look at the statistics that are associated with fatherlessness, but they are universally disturbing. Our world certainly needs a revival of fathers and fatherhood right. as a culture, right. as a society. Yeah. And that is a whole other message. But I believe that within the church, there is also a need for those that step into the role of a father here today. You see, a father is different than a teacher or a professor. They aren't a professional. They don't work on a schedule. They don't get to have a private life where they can live by a different set of values than what they proclaim in the classroom. Uh, most, most of their instruction is not going to be uh, by a curriculum, but rather it's going to be by demonstration, by being their hands-on, by imparting their skills and their values and their abilities on uh, to their children. And here is another primary difference, and that is that a true test of a father is not when their child graduates. There is not some kind of uh, program where you get to uh, say, well, I've raised my children to this certain age and we're going to have a ceremony and they're going to graduate and now they are no longer my problem. But rather the real test of fatherhood is when the child or children that they have been a father to become successful adults. The moment when they stand on their own two feet in the real world and they have the skills and they have the values and they have the morals to survive out in the real world. And that is at the crux of what I believe the message here today is. Elijah is, as noted, the uh, great prophet that in many ways becomes the prototypical prophet that represents all others. And uh, when Jesus was transfigured, it's no coincidence that it was Moses and Elijah that appeared with him talking about the uh, events that would soon come to pass. Uh, because Moses represented the law and Elijah represented the prophets. Uh, and so he is a man that has this profound impact. Uh, he is a larger than life kind of character. Uh, this man that comes and he proclaims brave things. And maybe his greatest success in his ministry is where he, as a lone prophet, uh, challenges all of the prophets of Baal uh, in a country that is now dominated by Baal worship, uh, a place where the prophets of God have been hunted down and killed. Uh, but he calls them out uh, and calls them to a challenge out in the open on Mount Carmel. Uh, and so it ends up that by the time that the prophets of Baal and then the, the prophets of the uh, consort goddess Asherah are assembled. Uh, there are 850 of them and there is one of him. 
And he says, all right, here's the challenge. We will both build an altar uh, each in our turn and we will call upon our God. Uh, and the God who answers by fire, uh, he is the real God. And he allowed all of the priests of Baal and Asherah to go forth uh, or go first. And so they start to build their altar and they start to do their ceremony and they chant and they dance and uh, they do their incantations uh, and absolutely nothing happens. And Elijah, he is so bold, he is so brave that he starts to talk trash to all of them. He starts to mock their God and says, maybe you're not calling loud enough. Or maybe he's asleep. And if you look at the euphemism of the Hebrew, he even insinuates that maybe Baal has slipped out and he's out on the toilet and not able to hear them. And they just need to keep talking because soon he will be back and maybe he'll respond then. And he gets them into a fury where they start to cut themselves and they're they're slashing and they're, there's blood that is spattering and on they go for hours and hours to the place where they're all starting to get tired and worn out and he says alright boys that's enough now it's my turn and so he assembles a simple altar 12 stones representing the tribes of Israel and he digs a ditch around it all and then in the midst of a drought he asks them to start bringing water big the big bowl buckets of water and he pours it all over the altar and the sacrifice and until the, the ditch all around is filled with water. He's making things as difficult for God as possible. And then instead of any kind of dancing and incantation he gives a simple prayer and says ask God that because he is the true God to answer by fire and whoosh down comes the inferno and it incinerates the sacrifice and it incinerates Generates all the water up. And there in that moment, there is a clear demonstration uh, that there is only one true God. Uh, and it doesn't matter how much you may uh, try to manipulate things and dance and show and do your thing. Uh, you cannot separate God's power. You cannot replicate it. Uh, there is no substitute. Uh, and in that moment, it seems like the tide has turned and the people turn on the prophets of Baal to kill them and then uh, Elijah prays again. It's been a drought for three years. And he sees a cloud begin to come up from out in the Mediterranean. And so he tells the king, the wicked king, he says, uh, you better get on your chariot and get back to town because the storm is coming. And then the Bible says that this prophet of God, uh, he uh, ties his robe up and uh, he starts to run in front of the chariot. It's about an eight-mile run, and he outruns the chariot the whole way, trucking along his skinny prophet legs, whipping away, uh, and there he goes. Uh, you talk about a good day. He faces down all of these uh, false prophets. Uh, fire comes from heaven, uh, and then he runs, uh, you know, a half marathon and beats a chariot. You know, you're feeling pretty good. This is like a good day's work here. But life has a way of upending your apple cart and he gets word that wicked Queen Jezebel has said, he's done for. I am going to kill that prophet. And it's as if all of the faith and the power that he had had the day before just leeches out of him and he deflates like a balloon. And he goes into hiding out into the wilderness and he spends several days just lying under a tree wishing he could die. Angels are coming to feed him because he won't even bother to feed himself. It is very clear that he goes into a profound depression. Right. He's not brushing his teeth. He's not getting dressed. Uh, he's lounging around in his bathrobe. And uh, if he didn't already have a beard, he would have one by this point. And uh, it's scraggly and it's got twigs in it. And uh, and he is looking pathetic and there's bags under his eyes. And, uh, and so uh, God gives him one more meal and then says, I want you to head into the wilderness. And it must have been one great meal because it it lasts him for 40 days. The Bible says on the strength of that meal, he travels for 40 days to Horeb, which is the mountain far to the south in the Sinai wilderness where the Ten Commandments were given. And he goes there, and it's much like his own, just like the children of Israel had 40 days in the wilderness. He has his 40, or they had 40 years in the wilderness. He has his 40 days 
in the wilderness. And when he gets there, the Bible says he goes into a cave. And scholars believe that this may be the cleft of the rock where Moses was hidden while the glory of God passed by. And so he begins to feel a disturbance on the mountain of God. And so he steps out of the cave and he sees a first a great wind, the wind so powerful that it's ripping rock off the mountain. And then there is an earthquake and then there is a raging fire. But God is not really in any of these big supernatural acts. But then a still small voice speaks to Elijah and God was in the voice. Yes. God snaps Elijah out of his depression by giving him a fresh mission, a fresh sense of purpose. And let me just pause there for a moment and say when the man of God was in a deep and profound depression, God's cure for him was to give him new purpose in life. Right. If you struggle with depression, I think... You need to look at God's advice and you need to find renewed purpose in your life. You need to say, instead of saying, uh, I need to curl into a ball and I need to self-pity myself. Instead, you need to say, God, uh, help me to see what the next stage is for me. You're not done with me yet. Uh, you've got another plan. You've got another purpose for me. Uh, and God gives him a fresh commission uh, where he sets into emotion a series of events uh, that would decide the fate of nations. Uh, he told him, you're going to go back uh, and there's a wicked king on the throne right now, uh, but you're going to anoint a man by the name of Jehu uh, as the king of Israel, uh, and Jehu is going to deal with the house of Ahab, uh, he's going to deal with wicked queen Jezebel, uh, and things are going to change, uh, you're also going to go and anoint a new king over Syria, and that's going to bring about some interesting results, because Syria was the arch enemy of Israel at that point, but he was going to anoint a new enemy for his people as well. And the thing is, is that when you add up those two halves of the whole, uh, you will discover that between the new king of Israel that would come in the future uh, and the new enemy of Israel, God would, bur would purge Baal worship and Baal worshipers out of Israel altogether between the inside uh, and the outside influence. God would complete the victory that was begun at Carmel through other means. But I think the most important thing here is not the glamorous role of ordained kings. But God adds this. In 1 Kings 19 and 16, he says, And Elisha, the son of Shephat, of Abel Mahola, shall you anoint as prophet in your place. Now, there is no record in Scripture of Elijah being married. And if he was at some earlier point... It is clear that he was not during this main narrative. There's no mention of a wife, no mention of a family. There's no evidence that Elijah ever had any children. Now that's important because in this moment you see Elijah having this extreme swing emotionally. He goes from a very great high to a very deep low. There was no one to temper Elijah in his life. There was no one to comfort him, but there was also no one to challenge him, no one to talk sense to him, right. to help him to realize that his swinging emotions, that, you know, you can be too high and you can be too low sometimes, and there is someone to kind of bring you back into the balance there. Uh, there was no wife, there was no kids, there was no close confidant. Uh, Elijah was a loner. And that made him vulnerable. In fact, part of his complaint to God is that I alone am left. Uh, no one else loves you. No one else worships you. It's just me. Uh, I am alone. Uh, and God knew from the beginning. He says it's not good for man to be alone. So God was, in one sense, he was giving Elijah a friend. And for the next six or seven years... Of Elijah's life, he would not be alone, but Elisha would become a friend. Uh, but more importantly, uh, he would become the vessel that would give Elijah purpose. Uh, Elijah could begin to pour himself into uh, a vessel, uh, a disciple that he could train and mentor uh, and shape into his successor. Uh, God says he is going to be the prophet in your place uh, when you're gone. Uh, I'm not going to leave Israel without a prophet, uh, but you are going to be a part of of my process of, of training and preparing the next prophet of Israel. Now I want to point out for those that would come into the role of the prophet in training. I know having been a Bible college student and having 
served on a Bible college board and having taught at Bible colleges, I know the way that some Bible college students think and they think that, you know, the world has never seen anything like them. <laughs> And the moment that they are unleashed, revival is coming to Canada. And it is, of course, but probably not in the, the way that they think. And one of the main problems is, is that there are those that are in training for ministry that they have a conflicted view of what ministry is. I can tell you what's been part of my ministry. Brother Shane and I, a week ago... We were opening up that big septic tank back there. And we were fitting new pieces to get the risers to bring the level up where it needed to be. And you pop that lid off there and there was a cloud of flies that came up around you. And you know what? That's not a moment where you feel the holiness of God. <laughs> All over you. In fact, Shane breathed it enough that day that he had to go home sick for the next day. It was not a glorious moment. But it was part of the work of God. The Bible says of Elisha in 1 Kings 19, 21, Then he arose and followed Elijah and became his servant. Elisha served Elijah. He was to be the next prophet. But his first job was a job. He worked. He did menial task. I'm sure he made mistakes. Instead of preaching the sermons, he sometimes carried the, the notes for the preacher. Yeah. And supported him as he went to the pulpit. And he probably did his own work of setting up camp as they traveled. And maybe even spent his own time around the septic tank as a part of the realities of living on the road. Nor was the journey quick. Elijah, Elijah came and called him, and it's not like the next week Elisha became the new prophet. It is thought that Elijah mentored and discipled Elisha for at least six years. Six years could be a long time when you're waiting to be the next big thing for the spotlight to swing your way. But it did not swing his way quickly. No. What's interesting, in fact, is that Elisha is mentioned as being called in 1 Kings chapter 19. But then chapter 20 starts, and it continues on through the end of 1 Kings. And it never mentions Elisha one time. It goes back to talking about all that Elijah was doing. Elijah's ministry, Elijah's successes, and Elisha is not mentioned at all. All. Second King starts in the first chapter. Uh, no mention of Elisha, just a mention uh, of what Elijah was doing. Uh, and so for the four chapters in between uh, where he is called and the day in which Elijah is taken away, uh, there is no mention of Elisha at all. Uh, the focus is back on Elijah and the work that he was doing for God. Uh, there is no record of Elisha doing profity things in between. But clearly... Elijah was taking his role seriously, as we're soon going to see. Towards the end of this period, Elisha has been faithfully walking with Elijah. But there's an unease in his spirit because it is clear that something is about to change. He sensed that something was about to happen, and Elijah actually prompts him. says, i got to go and do something. He says, why don't you stay behind? And Elisha says, no, uh where you go, I go. A couple of times, Elijah gives him an opportunity yeah. to, to turn aside, yeah. to stay back, to do something else. Elisha says, no way. I am going to be with you to the end. And as they got close to the place where the school of prophets was, and uh, as we read in our text, the sons of the prophets, uh, first one group and then another warns him, uh, you know, in the, uh, the, the way the Bible college students can do uh, with great tact, they say, hey, you know you're about to lose your master, right? <laughs> and Elisha's response shows just what he thought of their helpfulness. He says, yes, I know. Keep silent. <laughs> that's not a paraphrase. That's an exact quote. But if you want the paraphrase, it says, yeah, I know. Shut up. 
And the next group says it, and he says the same thing to them. It's like, get out of my face. Finally, he and Elijah left the other group, and there's a group of 50 that watched them. As they come up to the Jordan River that is rushing by, and Elijah, he takes the mantle that he wore over his shoulder, the representative of his office as the prophet. And he takes it, and he rolls it up, and he steps up to the water, and he strikes the water, and the water parts to either side. And Elijah and Elisha, they walk across dry ground, just like the days of Moses, just like the days of Joshua. And on the other side of the Jordan, Elijah finally acknowledges what everyone seems to know. That he was soon to be taken away. And he says, before I go, Elisha, is there anything I can do for you? And Elisha says, what I would ask is that I be given a double portion of your spirit. And they keep walking and talking. And Elijah tells them, he says, you've asked for a, a big thing. This is a hard thing. He says, but if you're with me, if you see me when I am taken away, he says, God's going to provide it. He says, if you don't, if you're not there, it won't happen. But shortly after this conversation, as they walk and talk, chariots of fire appear to supernaturally take Elijah away. And I want you to note Elisha's response in that moment, uh, that uh, as he is, is prepared, uh, verse 11 says, Then it happened, uh, as they continued on and talked, uh, that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire uh, and separated the two of them. Uh, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Uh, and Elisha saw it, and he cried out, uh, My father! My father. Some moreover, the six years that they had spent together, uh, Elijah had become more than a master or a mentor. He had become a father to Elisha. He had modeled the character and the courage and the godliness uh, that Elisha needed. Uh, he had taught him like a father, not out of a textbook, uh, but by living the values day in and day out. Uh, he had taught hands on. Uh, he had showed him by word and deed. Uh, this is how a man of God lives. Uh, this is how a prophet of God operates. Uh, he had given practical examples uh, to his words of instruction. And while the Bible is not recording the things that Elisha, or Elisha did, I believe that Elijah was giving him little extra added responsibilities as they went. As he matured, he was expanding the role that Elisha was playing, preparing him knowing that this day was going to come. Elisha hadn't served in the school of the prophets. He didn't graduate with a degree in theology or prophecy. But instead, he served a man of God uh, who became a spiritual father to him. Uh, and the test for Elisha, it didn't come in a final exam or a graduation ceremony. It came after he had watched his master, his spiritual father, ascend into heaven. It came when he walked over and picked up the mantle that had fallen. And he took the mantle and he walked back to the banks of the Jordan River. He's on the wrong side of the river now. And as he stood there on the shore, he took that mantle and he rolled it up, just like he saw his mentor do. And he smote the water. And he said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And as he struck the water, the waters parted. And when he arrived back on the far shore and the sons of the prophets, the Bible college students, they saw what was going on. They knew that there was a new prophet in Israel. Elisha's double portion ministry began in this moment when he confirmed that God wasn't just the God of Elijah, but that he would be the God of Elisha. Yes. Where is that God? 
Well, when he struck the water, he got the answer. Uh, that God didn't leave with his mentor. Uh, that God didn't leave with the former generation. Uh, but the same God that did the miraculous uh, under the ministry of Elijah, he was still around and ready to do the work uh, under the ministry of Elisha. It was time for a new generation. Uh, a new generation was stepping on the, the scene. Uh, but the same God who had walked with Elijah, he was still there to walk with Elisha. And his promise was... Uh, you call on me uh, and I will be there with you. Uh, I will not only be the God of Elijah, but I will be the God of Elisha. Yes, yes. You see, today I'm preaching to fathers, calling for fathers to become Elijah's, to take on sons and daughters, whether they're your biological children or spiritual sons and daughters. With the intent of passing the mantle on to them. This mantle that I had got here today, I got it at a general conference a long time ago. It's probably been 15, maybe 20 years ago. And I got it in a, a service that was designed around this where the senior ministers, the elders, they were encouraged to find a young minister and to lay their hands on them and the... Ladies division have worked to create all of these beautiful mantles and as they prayed over them They were to take the mantle that they had been given to pass on and they were to put it on the shoulders of a young man Saying God's going to be with the next generation He's going to walk with them You see too often we adults fall into the trap of doing everything for our children Rather than mentoring and training them. When you fill out your tax form, you list how many dependents you have. And sometimes we get stuck in the mode of thinking of the next generation as just being our dependents. That we are there to take care of them and to provide for them and to hold their hands and to solve all their problems and to get them out of all of their messes. Uh, and the problem is, is what God is wanting from us is not to think of them as eternal dependence, uh, but rather for us to mentor and to equip them uh, for the day of independence. Uh, I've got news for you. Uh, whatever they call your generation, uh, your generation is not the final generation uh, where God's hand and God's blessing and God's work needs to be done. Uh, whether you are a senior today uh, or you're here just as a teenager in this service, uh, if the Lord tarries, there are generations that will come behind yours and God's work is not going to finish when my generation steps off the scene there wasn't a time that long ago where I was the young person I was the young generation and now there is ample evidence on this head that I am no longer a child or a young man any longer but time is passing by as it always does and if my ministry is only something up in what I have accomplished, uh, those that I have reached, uh, those that I have uh, shepherded over and treated as dependents, uh, then I have failed in that process uh, because my job and my calling uh, is not to be the be all end all minister. Uh, but when God gave the fivefold ministry, uh, He said its purpose uh, was to equip the saints uh, for the work of ministry, uh, it was to empower uh, others uh, to go and to do the work of God. It's not possible for one man or one ministry couple to do the work that God has to do in this community. But it is possible if we can mentor a generation of Elishas that will step up and take the mantle and say, where is the God of Elisha? Where is the God of Pastor Abbott? And they step up and take authority. God has a work to do in them. I tell you, dads, moms, too, we've got to get better at making our children less reliant on us and more reliant on God. Yeah, Quit teaching your kids that you're the one that solves all their problems. <laughs> I'll be speaking to Richard after the service. <laughs>
But instead, we need to teach them to be more reliant on God. Don't just pray for your kids. Teach your kids how to pray. Don't just do everything for them, but teach them both practical and spiritual skills. Rather than thinking of them as too weak to face any challenges on their own. You've heard the term helicopter parents. It's become so common in the age in which we live, parents that just hover around their kids. And try to shield them from every little hurt. Make sure that they're always treated fairly, that even when they're losers, they're proclaimed winners. (laughs) Tell you what, though, I can hover over my kid all day long on the basketball court, and it's not going to make him LeBron James. (laughs) There is a a practical limit that sometimes parents are so unaware of and in their process of trying to shield their kids, they're creating weaklings. They don't know how to stand on their own or face any challenge on their own. And as a byproduct, they sometimes venture out in the real world and they don't like it very much and they immediately run back home because their boss didn't tell them what a beautiful boy they were their first day. (laughs) See, the true test of a son is not when he leaves home, but when he stands on his own two feet and takes up the mantle of responsibility. The test of a true Christian is when he or she stands independently of her parents and says, where is the Lord God of my father, of my mother? It's that first time that they fast and pray. Not because their parent or their pastor told them to. Because something in them is crying out to get a hold of God. They've got a need in their life and they have learned by example uh, that when you pray and you fast, heaven hears uh, and heaven responds. uh, And those times when you hear that as a parent, uh, that they're fasting and praying uh, and you had nothing to do with the process, uh, but they are in their own process of getting a hold of God. uh, You know that there was something uh, that was passed on, uh, a mantle that was passed on. Uh, The first time that they dig down deep uh, and they go into that little savings account uh, and they pretty much empty it and give sacrificially uh, because they feel the burden of sacrifice, uh, the appeal that has gone forth for missions uh, or a cause. uh, And they go and as a parent you're like "Mm." (laughs) they have so little But you have to bite your tongue in those moments uh, and allow them to step up and to feel the call of God, uh, to feel that burden uh, because God is creating strength in them. Uh, Don't you worry about your kid in that moment. Uh, The same God that they are honoring, uh, he's going to take care of them financially uh, just the same way that he has done for you. Uh, The God of your generation uh, will be the God of their generation. It's those moments when they linger around the altar, uh, when others are moving on or talking or thinking about the next meal uh, because something in them is crying out for more. Uh, It's when they face temptation uh, without any support uh, and they make the hard choice to stand up for God, uh, not because it's mom and dad's values, uh, but because it's their values, uh, because it's their faith. Uh, They're not doing it for your sake. Uh, They're doing it because the God of Elijah has become the God of Elijah. And it's in their hearts. This is my God. This is my faith. This is my value. Our greatest success as fathers is not when we give for our children. Or when we pray for our children. Or when we defend our children. But when they stand up. And they do those things themselves. Because we have successfully taken the mantle off of us and we passed it on to them. They don't need to stand behind you while you strike the water and part the sea for them. They need to pick up that mantle and step up to the water themselves and strike the water and say, where is the God of Elijah? Yes. Because the same God 
that parted the waters for Elijah is the same God that will part the waters for Elisha. This Father's Day, I'm calling for fathers to step up and to step forward and saying, I'm ready to commit to passing the mantle. To invest in the next generation. If all you do as a man is complain about kids these days, you're not doing your job. If they lack the skills that you have, if they lack the morals that you have, if they lack the capabilities, it's because somewhere we have come up short in passing the mantle on to them. So instead of lamenting over what they don't have, my challenge to us today, men, (coughs) is to give them what they don't have. To train them, to show them, to model for them the strength, the character, the godliness that they need. Paul says, I would that men everywhere would lift up holy hands without wrath or doubt. I want you to know if you're a young person here today, the same God that helps Pastor Abbott, yeah. he's going to help you. Right. Yeah. There, I'm thankful for those who have been saved under my ministry, that have been filled with the Spirit, have been healed, all of those things. I'm thankful for all of that. But my greatest job is to equip spiritual sons and spiritual daughters For when I'm long gone, that the truth marches on. Will you stand with me this morning? John wrote in one of his little short epistles, I believe 1 John, or excuse me, 2 John, says, I have no greater joy than to hear my children walk in truth. I have a challenge for you today, fathers. And I'm going to invite the men of the church to come forward at this point. If you will come forward, and we're going to pray over you. We're going to pray over each other and pray that God is going to help us. So whether you're a young man, you're an old man here today, we you come forward today, amen. Whether you have biological children or not, God is calling to you today. There is strength in the men of this church. There is capability in the men of this church. And God has got a calling and a purpose for us today. And that calling is, is not only to take the mantle of responsibility upon ourselves. But the calling is, is that we would pass on that mantle to the next generation. I'm calling for fathers today that are ready to pass on truth, that are ready to pass on value. Fathers, let's step up right now and make a commitment to God. Pray for someone nearby you. Lord, help us right now, I pray, to be men of God, to be men of truth, Lord, I pray, to be fathers, Lord, I ask in Jesus' name.